Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is uh, Stefan Hoffmann speaking. On behalf of Daimler, I would like to welcome you to our Q1 results conference call. We are very happy to have with us today Harold Wilhelm, our CFO. In order to give you maximum time for your questions, Harold will begin with an introduction directly, followed by a Q&A session. The respective presentation can be found on the Daimler IR website. Now, I would like to hand over to Harold. Thanks a lot, Stefan, and hello, everybody. <coughs> Good morning uh, to that uh, Q1 call, I and mean, I would say, which is may maybe a bit more than a Q1 call, let me call it a bit kind of a preview or testimony of uh, luxury meets tech, of margin expansion, of value creation being ahead of us. That quarter gives us confidence uh, to push ahead with our work, both on the strategic and the operational side. We already disclosed I mean, the, the figures last week, so today we'll go more into the details, but also talk about the outlook, obviously. Let's jump to the key messages on page uh, two. First, uh, the Q1 margin uh, at cars and vans demonstrates, I would say, the strength of our portfolio and our ability to lower the break-even point. Cash-wise, we look at an excellent level of net industrial liquidity. The key drivers of that were an effective working capital management and a stringent capital allocation. On the project focus, I mean the spin-off and the listing of the Daimler truck by the end of this year, uh, that work is well underway with a lot of preparation work, obviously. <clears throat> and it will be submitted to an extraordinary general meeting in autumn where Daimler shareholders will be asked to prove this historic uh, strategic step. Product-wise, uh, we are very proud that lately we could present three full electric vehicles to the world, the EQS, the EQA, and the EQB. They underline our ambition to lead an electric drive and car software with high-tech luxury EVs. Recently, one of you called it luxury meets tech. As you could see in the intro, I love it, and we are well prepared to deliver on that. Looking on the key figures, uh, page three, in the first quarter, we sold 729,000 uh, vehicles worldwide. That is a plus of 13%. The revenue grew by 10%. If you adjust it uh, for uh, FX, it's 15%. EBIT cash flow nil reflect the impact of group-wide ongoing positive development on top line side, as well as the cost measures paying off. The free cash flow of the industrial business was at 1.8 billion, including the payment made in connection with the settlements with US authorities on diesel adding to a net industrial liquidity of more than 20 billion. Now let's have a look at uh, Mercedes-Benz cars. Well, we started uh, well at cars and vans, I mean, into the, the year, <coughs> into 2021. I would say we could keep uh, the positive momentum of the second half of uh, 2020. With the new S-Class and also the attractive SUV portfolio, we have a fascinating product uh, and favorable mix that drives pricing. The S-Class sales and orders are very encouraging. The first quarter, we sold I mean, more than 15,000 units, and that means deliveries to customers. GLE and GLS remain top picks among our customers as well. Our global EV share increased further and was in that quarter already more than at about 10%. In Europe, that means one in four cars sold by Mercedes and Smart were, were electrified. Yet, we delivered on the margin. With this development, we're on track to achieve our 2021 EU CO2 targets. Internally, we drove our fixed cost reduction measures and cost discipline further and showed overall positive industrial performance. At our Stuttgart and the Turkheim plant, we're gearing up uh, for electric first uh, future. That means the Mercedes-Benz Drive System campus will become a technology competence center with a campus focusing clearly on electric drive and battery technology. That means transformation is actually taking shape. 
Let's have a look at uh, the <coughs> EQ product portfolio on the page six. In the first months uh, of 2021, we presented three full electric EQ models, the EQA, the EQB, and our first uh, Mercedes-Benz all-electric platform in form of the new luxury sedan EQS. The EQS is the first model in the Mercedes family to be based on an electric-only architecture for luxury and executive class electric vehicles. It's the S-class of the EVs and raises the bar for sustainable high-tech luxury with industry-leading range, aerodynamics, and refinement. It delights the driver with a full electric range of up to 770 kilometers according to WLTP and an output of up to 385 kilowatt. Over-the-air updatability, the new and impressive MBUX hyperscreen and so many more features. Furthermore, the EQS is recharged in just 15 minutes for up to another 300 kilometers and in terms of aerodynamics, we achieved a new best value of 0.2. We're excited by the initial feedback that we have gathered so far for the EQS. Just to quote two media, the EQS sets a high bar for lux large luxury EVs, a really, really high bar. Or stepping into the EQS is like stepping into a car from the future. We are deli delighted by that feedback. Launch to the market in Europe uh, will be in August this year, to be followed by US and China by the end of this year, beginning of next year. On the EQA, we have already more than 20,000 orders for that uh, compact vehicle with progressive design, extensive range, and intuitive operation based on MBUX. On the EQB, it's a seven-seater with a unique position among electric cars, compact on the outside, spacious on the inside, all electric through and through. There is more to come. The EQE and the SUVs on a fully electric platform in 2022. By the end of next year, a total of eight Mercedes EQ electric vehicles will therefore be produced at seven locations on three continents. So you see, we are serious to move on an all-electric world only. <clears throat> Page number seven on the market. We can see that uh, China is running well above last year's level and above pre-COVID level. For Europe, after recovery in the course of uh, 2020, we see a slow but encouraging start in, into 2021, back to about pre-COVID level. And in the U.S., it was a slow start, but a steady recovery, we are coming back to pre-COVID level. Note, however, that the underlying market demand is even stronger. However, the semiconductor availability refrained us from re realizing that full potential. Now on the van, page 8, we uh, <coughs> continue uh, to make progress uh, on uh, the turnaround uh, which we started uh, last year and to make that sustainable. The efforts are clearly paying off. We have uh, a volume growth with strong profitability underpinned at the same time by a lower cost base. The sales performance is strong with best first quarter in the US and in China. The group sales of electric vans uh, quadrupled compared to Q1 2020. And uh, we drive a consistent implementation of the electric strategy at the Vans division as well. The next generation e Sprinter is based on a newly electric, on a newly developed electric versatility platform coming to market in the second half of 2023. Now on the financials for Mercedes-Benz cars and, and vans, Q1 sales and revenues are ahead of last year. Sales increased by 15% to 627,000 units. Revenue is increased by 16%. If we adjust for FX here, we were up around 20%, which demonstrates significant uh, mix improvement. The EBIT adjusted grew to 3.8 billion. The CFBIT turned positive to 3.1, demonstrating the focus on the cash flow. Let's have a more detailed look at the, uh, the margin bridge. The favorable sales momentum at Mercedes-Benz cars translated in a significant increase in volume, structure, 
and pricing, where main drivers were especially S-Class, GLE, and GLS, but also on the lower end of the portfolio of the GLA and GLB, they had also a very positive contribution. The overall pricing environment furthermore had a positive impact on discount levels and residual values continued to develop favorably. The ruble and the US dollar drove a negative FX result of about 130 million. The industrial performance developed significantly positively on the production and on the material cost side. Additionally, we extended the useful lies as explained in our last year's disclosure. We worked on the reduction of selling and marketing expenses, however, without compromising on the market appearance, as you can see with the EQS presentation. The same holds true for G&A, where we continue to hold a tight grip on cost. The R&D came in with about 120 million higher year over year, which reflects, as we guided for, a slight increase in our technology roadmap. In the other lines, the most prominent driver is the increase at, of the at equity result of BBAC with a total of 480 million in the first uh, quarter. Remember, first quarter 2020 showed a COVID impact in China. In addition, we had a positive impact from the remeasurement at fair value of the charging infrastructure operator charge point resulting from its IPO and a smaller M&A real estate transaction. Both topics amount to about 1% point ROS in Q1. The adjustments in the quarter include expenses for legal proceedings and personal cost optimization programs, furthermore income of 600 million in connection with establishment for the GV for few cells, cell-centric resulted in a positive contribution. Looking at the cash flow, page 11, the change in working capital underpins a controlled inventory management given the increased sales volume and the richer middle model mix. Due to the semiconductor shortage, we had to pre-produce some components because we anticipate to recover part of the lost volumes by the end of the year. As you can see, the net investments in PPE and intangible assets, there's a depreciation, amortization, and impairments, continues on an almost balanced level, reflecting our rigorous approach to capital allocation. The other line is straightforward. It includes the adjustment of the BBAC at equity result, other non-cash book gains uh, within the, uh, the segment, i.e. the charge point, the cell-centric, and cash out from provision consumption. Finally, the other bucket includes uh, the payments in connection with the ongoing governmental and legal proceedings and measures taken with regard uh, to uh, Mercedes-Benz diesel vehicles. This relates in particular to the payments made in March 21 in settlement of civil and environmental claims made by several U.S. authorities in the prior year in connection with emission control systems used in certain vehicles. On the adjustments, uh, we have diesel payments, the Volvo GV with a cash inflow of 310 million and payments made in connection with the personal cost optimization program. Now let's move over to trucks and buses. Here we could drive a sales growth in the first quarter. The increase of truck sales came mainly from Europe and North America due to improved market conditions, but also from gains of market shares. However, at the bus side, especially the coach bus segment was hit strongly by the effects of COVID-19. Incoming truck orders in all regions were significantly above prior year's quarter. The impact from semiconductor shortage was not very material in the first quarter. The first quarter, we were able to further reduce our used vehicle stocks. Net pricing developed favorably. End of February, we announced our plan to cooperate with Cummins. We signed an MOU to establish a global strategic partnership for medium duty engine systems. And we also could close in the quarter uh, the fuel cell joint venture with Volvo, which we announced already before. <clears throat> Let me uh, emphasize a few points on these on the page uh, 13. So uh, for the fuel cell, <coughs> Volvo Group acquired a 50% interest in the existing company. Daimler Truck Fuel Cell for approximately 600 million euros. Daimler Truck and Volvo Group have agreed to rename the company as Cell Centric. 
together we aim at uh, uh, to commence uh, serious production during the second half of this decade. In February, on the Cummins side, we uh, announced uh, an MOU concerning the Global Strategic Partnership uh, for Medium Duty Engines. As part of the planned strategic uh, partnership, Cummins will invest in the further development of the medium duty engine platform and its uh, global production and supply for Daimler trucks and buses as of the second half of this decade. Cummins is about to establish an engine plant within the existing Mercedes-Benz Mannheim campus to localize medium duty engines. What does that mean altogether? The, uh, these moves allow us to focus on our investments and to allocate capital to those areas where our future lies. Daimler Trucks invests in the development of zero emission drive technologies and the further development of our own heavy duty engine platform. On the market uh, side, page uh, 14, I think that the chart impressively shows that in the key regions, we are already back on pre-COVID levels uh, by the end of uh, Q1. Especially January and February are historically low sales months because of the production shutdown in December and the strong deliveries in the Q4. With a production pipeline built uh, uh, back, we saw a strong march. <clears throat> Incoming orders exceeded the prior year's figure by 63% significantly, benefiting from the economic recovery. Level of incoming orders increased uh, by 58,000 units to 150,000 units in the first quarter of 2021. This development is impressive and should cover as well for the sales development in the coming quarters. Book to bill, therefore, was at 150% coming in particular from Europe and uh, the U.S. as well as Asia. That means we're literally sold out in North America, and if you look at the incoming order levels, it's important to mention that we did not open the order book yet for the next year. On the financial side, the sales increased uh, by 4% uh, to 101,000 units. The revenue uh, decreased slightly by 1% uh, to 87 but remains close to prior year level. Uh, adjusted for FX revenues increased by 5%. Adjusted EBIT more than doubled and amounted to 518 million euros. See EBIT turn positive to 435 million. Looking at uh, the margin walk, <coughs> higher truck unit sales mainly in Europe and North America resulted in positive volume structure and also net pricing, including a positive contribution from used trucks, business and after sales. Pricing development is also favorable across all regions. FX results this quarter was slightly burdened by the U.S. dollar, translation effects that were offset with transactional effects from other currencies. Within the industrial performance, we see slightly higher costs for raw material as well as supply chain constraints and logistic costs. Bear in mind that quick quarter one 2020 was not yet hit by COVID-19. Overall, selling expenses stayed at about the same level, as well as uh, SG&A. In the positive other line, we have included, for example, a better at equity result from our Chinese GV with Photon. That leads uh, to uh, the EBIT adjusted of 558 million, which equals a return on sales of 6%. Adjustments include the GV with Volvo and expenses for restructuring measures, the buses, on the other hand, uh, is facing a very tough business environment. On the cash flow side, we can see that the working capital in the Q1 was uh, quite good. Even though we are operating at a higher market level, yet the working capital grew under proportionate. Used vehicle stock is on a record low level as well. The net financial investments reflect uh, the cash contribution attributed to the Daimler trucks from the self-centric GV with Volvo. Depreciation and amortization exceeds net investment in PPE and intangible assets underlying our focused investment approach. The other line simply adjusts uh, the EBIT effect from the self-centric settlement, and that leads uh, to a CF bid of 620 million adjusted for restructuring measures and uh, equity injection. Um, so the uh, uh, CF bid adjusted uh, amounts uh, to 435 million, which is a cash conversion rate of 0.8. Over to uh, mobility, page 18, compared to 
the first quarter last year, we could see a slight increase in new business, mainly driven by strong loyalty and customer retention, especially in China. Credit reserves are on a stable level with continuously low net credit losses. Also at the Daimler Mobility, the execution of our efficiency measures shows a positive impact on earnings. Absolute OPEX figures go in the right direction. At our mobility services, we are further optimizing our shareholdings and improve our operative business. Let me pick a few examples. Uh, recently, uh, we announced a plan uh, to sell the, the Park Now Group um, with to Easy Park. At uh, Charge Now, we aim uh, to gain a new partner and investor with BP, joining Daimler Mobility and BMW Group as a third investor. At Free Now, we continue our growth plan. We will launch uh, multi mobility services in more than 30 new cities in 2021. And also in Share Now, we start worldwide the first reward program in 14 cities in, in Europe. On the financials, page 19, the new business uh, was up uh, by 4%. The contract volume amounted uh, to 153 billion. That is 1% uh, higher than at the end of 2020. However, the portfolio decreased in Europe and Americas, but could be overcompensated by FX effects. Adjusted EBIT increased significantly to 691. And uh, page 820 shows you how we could get there. <clears throat> so uh, that means uh, that uh, 691 equals uh, 18.7 percent return on equity adjusted let me briefly explain when how we could get there small and negative uh, FX effect uh, key reason for the EBIT improvement uh, compared to last year come the, came from the lower credit risk provision and the higher interest rate margins after an increase of credit reserve in the past year we could see a further flattening of credit risk provision by the beginning of this year Absolute net credit losses are below the long-term average. Cost of credit risk ratio is at 0.25% compared to 158, 1.58 in the same period last year. Furthermore, positive operative business performance contributed uh, to a higher EBIT. The adjustments of 54 million versus last quarter relate mainly to one-time effect coming from the sale of shares in VR Inc. I have uh, uh, already explained on the group level, page 21, in the division walk. So uh, the reconciliation includes cost for further cost efficiency measures at the group level and group uh, project related expenses. Um, therefore, we can uh, see that uh, uh, the, uh, the group uh, uh, all in uh, EBIT is at 5.7 and on an adjusted basis at uh, 5. The adjustments amount to 778 million as we could see in the division part already. Page 22 on the free cash flow. We highlighted already the division sections. So what else? The cash taxes are at uh, 355 million, which is as usual for first quarter slightly below the average. Pension effects of 126 negative, that's mainly due to internal transfers between the entities. The reported uh, free cash flow from the industrial business is at 1.8 billion and includes 0.9 for the payment made in the settlement with the U.S. authorities, as I explained already before. Free cash flow adjusted uh, for legal proceedings, uh, restructuring measures uh, and M&A is at 2.8 and uh, marks another step on our way towards a cash flow oriented culture. Page 23 on the net industrial liquidity, that stands at 20 billion, increased by 2.2 compared to year end 20. The increase is mainly due to the positive free cash flow of the industrial business and the slight positive FX effect. Invest and depreciation are basically balanced as you can see on the chart dispose of shareholdings uh, at uh, to uh, by 0.5 billion uh, worthwhile to mention three rating agencies upgraded their outlook uh, in q1 smp and moody's to stable and fitch to positive outlook 
overall, I would say, with that net cash position, um, that leaves us uh, with a very significant, significant financial flexibility. Now, we jump to the outlook, page 25. <clears throat> so how do we see the guidance for the full year? Before I start on that, please note uh, that all guidance uh, are made under the assumption you see on the slide, meaning no further COVID-19 related setbacks. Our expectation for the development of business in 21 are based on the assumption of a gradual normalization of economic conditions in the markets that are important to us. In particular, we assume that the world economy will be able to recover from the pandemic related weakness of the year 2020 aided by, among other things, the increasing availability of effective vaccines. Based on the expected global economic recovery, worldwide demand for cars and vans is expected to continue favorably this year, and significant growth in market volume is expected for 2021 as a whole. The Chinese car market, which performed better than most other market, major markets last year, should now grow significantly as well this year. This is a change to the market guidance we gave in February. The economic recovery should also result in improved demand in the major truck markets. That means that in North America and in the EU, we expect significant growth in demand for heavy-duty trucks. This is unchanged. Page 26, uh, <clears throat> we expect a continued positive stimulus from the economic recovery and good underlying demand for our products. We continue to expect the group revenue and EBIT in 2021 to be significantly above 2020. On the free cash flow reported, we keep our guidance that it will be below last year's figure due to the payments in the context of the settlement with U.S. regulators in civil law proceedings. At the full year disclosure, I also stated that we expect the free cash flow adjusted to be below last year's figure. As of today, however, we do expect free cash flow adjusted to be in the vicinity of the prior year level despite higher cash taxes. Our group guidance for invest R&D and uh, CO2 emissions remain unchanged. Page 27, on the divisional side, um, the, um, let me talk about the unit sales and uh, start with a general but important uh, remark. The current worldwide shortage of supply in certain semiconductor components affected deliveries in the first quarter and could further impact sales in Q2. However, we assume some recovery in Q3 and Q4. At this stage, the visibility is limited. Unfortunately, two events occurred in February that posed further challenges for the industry. While our supply chains were already tight and our reserve stocks were low, there was an interruption of about four weeks in the supply of utilities in semiconductor factories relevant to us in Texas, as you know, due to the storm as a result of which clean rooms were unable to operate. And in addition, as one is not bad enough, there was a fire in the semiconductor factory in Japan of one of our suppliers. We and all our partners in the supply chain are making great efforts and uh, taking various measures to reduce the impact of these significant production losses. Obviously, we monitor the situation closely on a 24-7 basis, and we are in constant exchanges with the suppliers. In terms of full-year sales, it is currently anticipated that lost volumes can be partly recovered by the end of the year. Based on those assumptions, or should, should I say despite those assumptions, the sales guidance for cars and trucks and buses uh, is unchanged at significantly above by a year. The full year disclosure is, I clarified, that significantly means here more than 7.5%, or you could uh, call that uh, <clears throat> half sun or fair weather. From uh, a customer demand perspective, we even would see more pull. However, opportunities beyond that level are at risk due to the discussed semiconductor issues. For vans, we increase our sales guidance also to significantly above from slightly before. Now on the ROS adjusted, the cars and vans, based on the strong Q1 development, we now expect uh, 10 to 12% for the full year. For trucks and buses, uh, unchanged at uh, 6 to 7%, confirmed by the good uh, Q1 performance. And uh, I think I made that comment and I make it again. I still see it at the upper end of that range, despite the semiconductor issues. 
For DMO, based on the strong Q1 uh, development, we now expect 14 to 15 percent for the full year. On uh, the divisional guidance for adjusted CCR, they stay at the healthy levels we communicated before. So to wrap it up in terms of uh, strategic priorities, page uh, 28, we outlined them uh, during uh, the full year this uh, disclosure in February. Um, I think we are making progress in the right direction. You can see that in Q1 uh, we could uh, increase, I mean, uh, the performance. We focus on profitable growth. We can leverage, I mean, pricing power. We made significant progress on cost efficiencies. Um, and uh, on that basis, uh, we uplifted, I mean, the guidance, as you see here this morning. Uh, we want to further accelerate on the technology side. We already made important steps in terms of electrification and uh, digitalization, and I think that has been uh, powerfully demonstrated uh, by the uh, product launches, in particular the EQS uh, uh, in April. By implementing project focus, uh, we aim to unlock the full potential of two strong independent uh, businesses. The plan is to complete the listing of Daimler truck until the end of the year. The truck uh, strategy uptake, update will take place on May 20th. Invitations will be sent soon. Please note the date. And uh, we will have the EGM uh, in uh, fall for shareholder approval and uh, another CMD in November. The Q1 showed we deliver on these priorities and we're looking ahead to make uh, our efforts long-lasting and sustainable. And by creating uh, uh, the two uh, pure play companies, uh, we want uh, to create Mercedes as the world's preeminent luxury and tech car business, leading in electric drive and car software with margins that reflect our luxury ambition. And with Daimler Truck, we want to establish it as the world's largest truck and bus producer and technology leader towards zero emissions. This being said, now it's really time for Q&A, I would say. Thanks a lot, Harold. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you may ask your questions now. A few practical points. Please ask your question in English. As a matter of fairness, please limit the amount of questions to a maximum of two. Now, before we start, the operator will explain the procedure. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to ask a question, please press zero and one on your telephone keypad. To remove the question, please press zero and two on your telephone keypad. Again, for a question, please press zero and one on your telephone keypad, then zero and two to withdraw. If you are using speaker equipment today, please lift the handset before making your selection. And the first question is from Aunt Ellinghorst, Bernstein. Your line is now open. Please go ahead. Hi, morning, everyone. Um, my first question is, uh, Harold, on these uh, bathroom disclosure rules. Um, and, and I wonder what you might do internally. Uh, how, how can you address these rules? How can you potentially improve your financial steering uh, and your guidance in order to deal with um, these issues? Because I think we all agree that these constant ad hoc um, releases um, are really terrible for the multiple because it sort of expresses as if the industry doesn't know what's going on and that these results are rather externally driven uh, than, you know, part of your, uh, your guidance. Um, that's my first question. And secondly, you just said uh, your, your net liquidity leaves you with significant financial uh, flex. Um, can you be a little bit more specific what strategically you have in mind with respect to the use of excess cash? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Arndt. Uh, well, I mean, on your first point, uh, <clears throat> I, I do understand uh, that, I mean, uh, uh, ad hocs are not pleasant for, for anybody, neither for you nor, nor for us, but the rules are the rules, and uh, we have a very tight interpretation of the BaFin rules. Um, uh, on the other side, I think we need to bear in mind uh, that uh, 2020, uh, we had significant volatility with COVID. Uh, 2021, we have the volatility on the semiconductor um, uh, and uh, I think we are on a major, major journey uh, in terms of uh, cost adjustment and uh, strategic reorientation. 
Uh, I mean, therefore, I mean, we have some volatility. Definitely, is my my interest. I mean, to uh, make that uh, more sustainable. I would say somehow if you follow Q3, Q4, and uh, Q1 in terms of underlying performance, that's what you see, and it's maybe better, I mean, to have an upside opportunity rather than a downside. On your second question, in terms of uh, liquidity, uh, I think when we're focused on right now is really, I mean, uh, number one, uh, to uh, continue uh, the journey in terms of cash flow focus or cash flow culture, we call it internally. There's a campaign ongoing, which is called, I mean, we are CFO. Uh, it does mean that we have 300,000 CFOs, no, but it means that uh, we want each and every employee to be cash flow oriented. Uh, and I really see good progress in this direction. That's what you can see also with the Q1 cash flow, I would say. Uh, then comes uh, certainly an important mark with uh, the project focus, where we want to equip both entities with a very solid net cash position. We'll talk about that later, obviously, when it comes to the spin-off agreements. Um, and uh, uh, with all of the transformation ahead, um, definitely I think it's good to, to be equipped with that solid I mean, uh, net cash uh, position, even if you could argue from a pure metric point of view that maybe there is one or the other i mean excess cash in uh, sitting in there but at this stage i think it's good to have that firepower all right thank you and the next question is from tim wilkosa deutsche bank your line is now open please go ahead yeah, good morning harold and stefan thanks for taking my questions it's tim from deutsche bank i'd also have two please and the first one is Harold, the two of us discussed about this multiple times. You understand the dynamics better than anyone. The capital market always plays the delta of expectations. Good returns create expectations of better ones going forward. So you delivered on promises. You have some interesting catalysts like this spin-off ahead. But the big question that we currently get from investors is, is this the peak? Can margins really only go down from here? What do you say to that? And then secondly, pricing is a key reason why your margins are where they are right now. And it's very strong for everyone currently, even less market players like Renault yesterday points to that. It's true for new and used cars. I appreciate this is very difficult, but any help here would really be much appreciated by us. Can you help us understand the dynamics around pricing? How much of this is really driven by increased demand for individual mobility? How much is artificially tightened supply because of the semi-shortage? How much is your own implementation of a different steering system now? How much is the EV push? Any help here would be much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Let me start with the second one, as maybe that answers also to, to some extent the first one. Uh, uh, I, there are two elements in it, I would say. The one is, uh, yes, I mean, it's happening across the market, uh, I mean, as you just outlined before. It's not something which is, I mean, only unique, I mean, uh, to us. We see it among uh, several players, I mean, in the, in the market. Uh, and, uh, I mean, after the Q2 shock of uh, COVID, yes, it seems uh, that uh, there, is, uh, there is demand going into, into passenger cars, um, in particular at the higher end and the premium and the, and, and the luxury space. I mean, that's clearly what uh, we can see. And all together, I think, I mean, the, the whole community, the whole industry reacted uh, in a responsible fashion, which means uh, uh, it seems not, not the dumping, I mean, the market with material, but adjusting quickly uh, the supply to uh, to the demand, and I would say that somehow explains uh, what we could see throughout the second half of 2020 and again in Q1 2021. But I really would like to emphasize that beyond that, uh, we 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 changed course, we changed strategy at our end, as we outlined last year uh, during the the strategy update, where we want to focus more on uh, premium, on luxury, but also on profitable growth. And yes, it means that we are not pushing like mad for volumes. And that has a healthy impact. That is a healthy impact on the pricing on the new vehicles. It has a very healthy impact on the residual values. It has a very healthy impact also on the level of used vehicles I mean, in the stock. So that is definitely what I can say for us what uh, we we changed and how do we do that i mean i cannot g just give you all of the 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 uh, the, uh, the the recipe uh, and the details here obviously but uh, that means uh, a very very detailed uh, margin steering uh, in the various markets uh, in the various products uh, where we decide where we push ahead and where we rather go on the break or where we stop 
In terms of the margin, your, your first question is at a margin peak. Uh, well, I mean, uh, the margin of 14% at cars and vans certainly in the Q1 uh, is, I think, uh, is, is reasonable. Uh, but, but as you can see with the full year guidance, I mean, that's where we see it. Uh, I mean, uh, as of today, including uh, the uncertainties I emphasized on the semiconductor issue, um, and uh, I, I would say, I mean, a margin of 10 to 12 percent uh, in a, yeah, what did we say before, in a fair or half sunny uh, environment, I mean, is, is really good to have. We know on the other side that uh, there is still dilution to come from uh, a step up in the, uh, uh, in the share of electric vehicles. Uh, but definitely, definitely, I think uh, yeah, we're starting from a higher base into the journey than we thought I mean, a year or two years ago, definitely. And maybe uh, we start from a higher base as well than we anticipated uh, uh, in, in summer or in fall uh, 2020. So I think uh, that's a good starting position. Thank you. Do you think the industry as a whole will remain price disciplined as soon as the semi-shortage is solved? Uh, That's definitely our intention, but I think it would not be appropriate uh, to say more on this call. Okay, thank you very much. The next question is from Patrick Homo, UBS. Your line is now open. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning, Harald uh, and Stefan. It's Patrick from UBS here. Um, two questions also from my side. Uh, the first one. Um, On investment and, and cash flow, uh, you, you highlighted uh, your, your focus on, on, on cash generation, the We Are a CFO campaign, uh, and uh, the results you've delivered so far are clearly uh, speaking for themselves. I'm just wondering, um, there are some players in the market that are now accelerating investment in some areas. You have some players that are going more vertically integrated into battery cell manufacturing, also because uh, battery cells seem to be tight. For years, um, there is talk about a higher vertical integration, also in you know semiconductor chains. For example, uh, you see some car companies uh, almost acting like venture capitalists in, in, in future tech areas, and the market seems to reward that as well. Um, growth seems to be more relevant um, than than it was uh, for OEMs in, in in the past few years. And uh, free cash flow, in a way, um, seems to get a little bit de-emphasized. I'm not saying you should give up your free cash flow focus, but I'm just wondering with the, the you know the tight framework you've given yourselves as far as the investments are concerned and your capex budget for the next few years, is it maybe time to review these capex numbers? Um, do you think you can cut that much elsewhere that you can uh, still stick to these capex numbers and 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 uh, do these growth investments that might be necessary to to be fully competitive in the future and the second question relates uh, to uh, the the progression of the chip shortage um, is it fair to say that uh, q2 will see a worse negative production impact than q1 and do you still think that ability to steer um, the chips towards the higher margin vehicles and you know the closure or, or the te short working hours in Rastatt and, and Prehman suggests that's still the case that you can really uh, you know allocate the chips to the high margin products um, is, is do you have that visibility that this will work out also for the remainder of the year or might there be some specific chips that will be missing particularly for the higher margin segment as well yeah thanks Patrick I mean on, on your first one <coughs> Uh, I don't think we are compromising on critical investments uh, in terms of uh, technology change or to enable our strategic objectives uh, to ramp up uh, electric vehicles. Um, definitely, I mean, uh, we constantly monitor and review that. Um, and uh, if we would consider I mean, any, any further any incremental need, I think uh, we would do As all know, I think we're still sitting on a significant level of an investment. It's not that we're taking that down to zero. I mean, uh, we, uh, we said we will take it down by 25%, uh, from, but from a pretty high level, 15 billion uh, R&D in CapEx. Um, so still, I think uh, that's an impressive number and leaves us, I mean, a lot of uh, opportunities uh, to invest into the right thing. And uh, probably it's a kind of a balance um, as... Uh, <coughs> Um, uh, I mean, uh, if we see higher need 
uh, in investment in these areas, I mean, probably it would it would balance off, i.e., decrease mean further investment or investment needs on the on on the ice side. Uh, how, however, I think uh, we should. I mean, we 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 look into that carefully, and we don't want to jump I mean, I mean too quickly here. Is uh, uh, we we still believe in the industrial strategy which we outlined, which means I mean to your point on battery. Uh, we want to be deep in technology and research here. That was also the point uh, I made in the intro on uh, the campus to be established here in Stuttgart, where we're just sitting in Unter Turkheim. Um, uh, but we don't want to ge- go deep in uh, in uh, in fuel cell um, in uh, production. Is uh, uh, that is uh, uh, probably developing and changing quickly, and uh, our amortization base might not be. Uh, high enough uh, to justify that level of investment. So, uh, rest assured, um, uh, we will do the right thing, uh, but to be able to do so, uh, first you need to generate the cash, and that's exactly what this campaign, i.e. the cash flow focus, is about. Second question um, on, uh, on SEMI. Conductors, uh, I alluded to, uh, I think in the in the guidance section that Q2 will probably be further impacted uh, as uh, the events in the in the first quarter, Texas and Japan uh, will uh, will impact the main production and then sales mean in in the second quarter. Then we do expect uh, some recovery I mean uh, with uh, the in the in the third and the fourth quarter. Why? As at least I mean in Texas, but also in Japan, we do assume that capacity will come back, um, and that the allocation will be done in a in a fair in a uh, uh, in, in in a fair manner, in line with the contractual main commitments. Yes, we allocate it in favor of the higher end products, and will continue to do so. However, I mean uh, it had had some some impact there as well, and I cannot exclude. That it uh, will uh, will impact uh, in in the second uh, quarter and for the remainder of the year, and all of these elements, also back to Tim's question before, are factored in into this uh, into this guidance of 10 to 12 percent. Therefore, many thanks, Howard. The next question is from Jose Asumendi, J.P. Morgan. Your line is now open. Please go ahead. Good morning, Harald Stefan. Uh, thank you very much, Jose, uh, JP Morgan. Uh, first, uh, congratulations on the uh, on, on the results. I think it's you know I'm sure it hasn't been a walk in the park to to, to get here, um, and uh, there's always more to deliver. I'm sure, uh, but you know it's also good to to reflect on what you have achieved. A uh, c- couple of questions um, in terms of the fixed cost reduction plans that you outlined already about you know more than a year ago. As we think about the, the auto and, and the truck division, I believe you wanted to achieve about 20% fixed cost reduction on auto. There was a, you know, probably about 5% to deliver in 2021. Can you give us an update on where, where do you stand in this in this category uh, and similar also to, to trucks? Uh, how far have you, what have you achieved so far and, and a little bit what, what can be done again in the coming quarters uh, without obviously going too much into the May event? Uh, and second question, um, with regards to China, um, can you talk a little bit about how the second quarter Mercedes-Benz cars momentum is, is trending versus Q1? Um, are you seeing a uh, you know, stable sequentially or maybe small deceleration or, or acceleration with, with that regard? And also, if you could comment a bit on the, on the truck side in China, you localized, I believe, your, a, a truck for the Chinese truck market, which I think could be, uh, I, I believe, a a game changer in the longer run. So, so you know, where do you stand on that on that product launch? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jose. Uh, uh, yeah, it's not a walk in the park. Uh, thanks for your comment in this respect. Uh, on the fixed cost uh, in, in 2020, I think we uh, we said that we we came down on uh, on cars and vans. On cars, I think it was about 15 percent from the top of my head, which we disclosed in February. So a large chunk. Uh, we also do know that uh, I mean some part of that in 2020 was helped and supported uh, by short-term working and short-term measures. So definitely uh, the uh, the challenge in 2021 uh, to keep that level of 2020 
uh, means is it's not a walk in the park as you need to replenish the Mendes 2020 measures by sustainable ones. What you see on the cars on the van side, I would say in the Q1, uh, we were able to do so, in particular on marketing and sales expenses, but also uh, fixed costs I mean, in the production field and also in, in the, the, the classical I mean, overhead areas. Well, there's a, there's a huge number of measures and sets, so that would definitely exceed that call here. Um, but it ranges, I mean, from efficiency, more digitalization, optimization, but also up to the point, I mean, that we're just uh, doing things at a less granular level uh, and a bit more focused. Uh, I look at my colleagues on the controlling and the reporting side, shortening the, uh, the forecast cycle, maybe hitting more level of granularity, as Arne pointed out at the beginning. Uh, I mean, little stuff and bigger stuff. Um, and I feel comfortable that we, we are able to uh, continue that journey uh, also in, uh, in, the, in the quarters uh, to come. Uh, maybe on the, on, the, on the truck side, we couldn't see exactly that momentum in the first quarter. Uh, in the fourth quarter 2020, however, I think we could really see a good momentum. And I'm sure uh, that uh, in the remainder of the year, we'll see that uh, coming through as well on the, on the truck side. Uh, on your China question, uh, it's, it's just great. The second quarter keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. It's really, uh, I think, an issue of the availability of the vehicles. Uh, could do probably uh, even, even, even more, uh, but here we're hitting, I mean, the limits of uh, the, the same issue, the, the chip issue, as we debated uh, before. Uh, and you can see in the full year guidance, so we uplift uh, China uh, from uh, uh, significant uh, to, uh, no, from, from, from slight to, to significant uh, on the basis of writing in a very high 2020 uh, starting point. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, all great here. And in terms of, I mean, the product side, uh, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, the localization of the of the actors I mean, in in China should give us a, a, a great opportunity in in the future. Uh, is uh, that is definitely I mean a market potential where we we should capture more, and therefore that was an important step. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harald. The next question is from Horst Schneider, Bank of America. Your line is now open. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you for taking also my question. Uh, good morning, Harold. Um, it's Hoxt here from Bank of America. Um, I have got um, one main question left. The other one has been partially already answered by you um, on the under trucks. Uh, but first of all, on restructuring, um, what strikes me is that you continue to book uh, fairly high charges. Um, so I, I know it's always difficult for you to talk about this personal cost-saving issue. Um, but uh, maybe can you tell us um, what, what level of savings you would expect this year, but then also the years thereafter, just provide an update on these personal cost savings, and then also how many more changes, uh, charges you plan to book in the next few quarters, and when should we expect uh, these payouts uh, to happen? Um, and also maybe you can provide a little bit of split and I mean, uh, how's it going to be booked or, or this, these, these um, savings, how they materialize by division. Then on Daimler trucks again, um, what, what I'm surprised about looking at this strong level of order intake that you have not raised the guidance for Daimler trucks because you said at the full year 20 call already that the guidance is rather cautious. Um, just want to know how I should think about that. Uh, maybe you want, just want to keep your ammunition for the CMD. I would understand that but maybe you can just reiterate if the guidance is still cautious or not on the other truck. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Horst. So on the restructuring, well, uh, yeah, I mean, let me share your view. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult decision, I mean, to sign, I mean, uh, pretty high checks per, uh, per employee. But, uh, I mean, a large chunk of, uh, I mean, the, uh, the overhead, the, the, the white collar, uh, reduction in the indirect area we were doing I mean, is sitting in Germany and I think you you know the rules of the game uh, so you have a certain set of levers at hand um, when we are not in the US or so not in the UK in other parts of the world so it is expensive uh, but uh, we 
have determined that we want to improve the underlying performance of the company um, and therefore, I mean, we, we have to swallow that, that pill. There is a clear trade-off, there's a clear break-even, there's a clear payback of that. I mean, otherwise we would not do that. However, it tells us something. Uh, it would be definitely stupid to do that if we would uh, ramp up fixed cost uh, and, and, and people again uh, in a year or two from now. So uh, by, by spending that amount of money, uh, we have to keep the fixed cost low reduce it even further with these measures, making use of the other uh, levers, in particular, I mean, uh, the, the attrition. Um, however, maybe to, uh, to give you a bit of comfort, um, the, uh, the program will continue, but you could see somehow, I mean, a high amount uh, in the Q1 as uh, the Escort uh, turbocharger ended by the end of March. And that made, I mean, a couple of people I mean, sign up uh, to uh, these agreements. So I don't expect the same pace in terms of uh, signing up uh, in the remainder of the year as we could see in the, in the, in the Q1. But again, uh, we are committed to take the fixed cost down. Therefore, we invest into that. Key thing, we have to keep, therefore, the fixed costs on a sustainable low basis. Otherwise, uh, we would do stupid things. Harry, can, can you say how many people have signed up by now? I think we're not disclosing that. Uh, uh, then, uh, right, no problem. It's yeah. too easy to do the math. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> on the truck side, uh, yeah, well spotted. Uh, well, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, what uh, the truck management team will say on the 20th uh, of, of May. No, I don't want to raise expectation, uh, but on the commercial side, I can say very clearly, uh, the demand level is extremely strong uh, in uh, the US, uh, in Europe, uh, uh, also in a Asia, so, but the key thing is, uh, is US and, and, and Europe. You can see that on the charts. I mean, with the orders, uh, with the book to bill of 150%, I emphasize. Um, uh, and uh, therefore, yes, I mean, we have the visibility that, I mean, we could uh, turn that also into sales. Uh, why uh, do we stay a bit more cautious here on the, on the sales side? I mean, for the, for the years, I mean, it's again, it's a semiconductor issue. Uh, well, I mean, from a today's standpoint, uh, it, it impacts main trucks as well. The impact in the Q1 was maybe more remote, uh, but definitely we see uh, uh, the impact for, for the trucks in the remainder year as well. That's why maybe not all of the commercial opportunities can be materialized, and that's why we stick with the guidance here. But uh, as I said, uh, we see it at the higher end. All right. Thank you. And the final question for today is from Dorothy Cresswell, exam. Your line is now open. Please go ahead. Oh, hi there. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I wanted to ask about two aspects of the electrification strategy. So we've recently seen your nearest competitors announce new electrification targets, and specifically BEV rather than XEV aspirations. And as you know, others have committed to a complete ICE phase out by a certain date. Um, should we expect you to adjust your official electrification targets too sometime in the near future? Um, and then could you give us your latest guidance on when you expect to reach the BEV profitability tipping point? I think in the past you said it could be by the end of the decade, but again, others seem to think it could be within three, four years or so. So I'm wondering where your relative caution comes from. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for, for, for that one. Uh, usually that was the first question uh, in the last uh, meetings. Uh, so thanks to raise it. As, uh, uh, that is definitely, I mean, our strategic priority. Uh, you can see very clearly from uh, the product presentations uh, uh, and uh, now the experience of uh, uh, the vehicles uh, being in the market uh, that we are very serious. Uh, to go into the direction of, uh, of BEF and BEF only. Uh, basically, it started I mean, two years ago uh, with the announcement of uh, the, this, uh, this ambition 2039. Since then, so, so much happened uh, in terms of uh, adjusting, I mean, switching gears 
towards uh, the best uh, only journey. Uh, now we have these products, um, so we have industrial flexibility. You know that the EQS comes off the same line as the S-Class here in Stuttgart, so we can ramp up. Uh, we can also ramp up quicker. Uh, we are very delighted, therefore, to see the customer feedback and uh, the endorsement uh, over the last weeks on the EQS. So I think uh, uh, now is a, is a really, really interesting juncture where we might see an acceleration. I'm not sure it makes a lot of sense, I mean, to go for the headline in terms of uh, when do you stop the last ice engine uh, in the valley. <coughs> Uh, what matters is uh, to have the great products at hand. That's what we're doing. More to come in terms of the products, and also uh, we're getting ready industrially uh, to, uh, to to raise a bar. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, I mean, on that one, on the margin side, uh, what you can see, I would say, in the, uh, with the first quarter results, we have about, I mean, 10% of uh, electric vehicle sales uh, in, in, the, in the total sales number, and despite that have a 14% margin. Uh, uh, we have a significant share, I mean, in the full year, we said I think uh, we, we go uh, to about 13% on, on the full year, and we give a guidance of 10 to 12%. So I feel much more comfortable today than a year or two ago that we can accommodate uh, the step up of the electric vehicles without uh, a, a too strong margin dilution. Are we at parity, margin parity today? No, we are, we are not, but progressively we're making progress um, and uh, uh, I will not disclose what our target is here now, but uh, definitely uh, uh, being at margin parity is not only at the end of the decay, it has to be before. Thank you so much. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your questions and for being with us today. And uh, also thank you, Harold, uh, a lot for your answers. Now, Investor Relations remains at your disposal to answer any further questions you might have. To all of you, have a great morning, great afternoon, or a great evening, and we look forward to talking to you soon. Thanks, and goodbye.